Bonjour. So today I'm going to be talking about Théophile Gautier and his fantastic tale, uh, Le Pied de Mommy, or The Mommy's Foot. Um, I'm going to go through some important general insights on the fantastic and the gothic that Todorov made in his um, Introduction à la littérature française, which is the fantastic as structural approach to a literary genre in English. Um, um, what I'm namely interested in is the role of the narrator, notions or other different traits, like Todorov called them of the fantastic, uh, that according to Todorov are uh, figurative speech, um, exaggeration or exaggeration, um, hyperbolizing, the exotic, uh, the dichotomy or rather two poles, the marvelous and the uncanny, mm, merveilleux, l'étrange. Uh, I'm also interested in uh, l'ambiguité, la folie, uh, mostly the, um, the dichotomy, reality, unreality, sanity, um, insanity visions, illusions, etc. And also how beauty and aestheticism are represented in um, The Mummy's Foot, which is, which appears through the entire Gautier's literary work. And we'll see later uh, why and how. Towards the end, I will uh, compare <laughs> this story to uh, Tarchetti's uh, A Dead Man's Bone. Uh, I'm so glad we were assigned to read this. I never heard of Tarchetti before. I mean, I'm not spe specialized in Italian literature. I, I possess the general knowledge, but I never heard of Tarchetti before, especially not at that man's bone. Uh, I have one question for Professor Corradi. Since we, since I could read everywhere, and especially in this uh, preface that Tarchetti uh, were convicted, well, were charged for, um, well, I don't know if he was really charged, but it is well known that he plagiarized Mary Shelley's stories. I was wondering if he plagiarized uh, Le Pied de Momy as well, because similarity, similarities are so blatant, are so obvious, and uh, I know that Dead Man's Bone was published 1869, whereas uh, Le Pied de Momy uh, was published in 1840. So I was wondering, I couldn't find any information about this, whether he really plagiarized or not, but at least the influence of Gautier, Gautier's tales is um, obvious on Tarchetti's work. Okay, first of all, uh, a few words on Gautier and his literary life for those of you who are not with, with, uh, familiar with him and his uh, literary uh, life and um, his writings. So he was born in Tarbes in 1811, which is uh, capital of haute pyrenees uh, department, uh, that's um, southwestern France. And he died in 1872. He comes from a petite bourgeoisie family uh, and they moved together uh, not long after his, his birth uh, to Paris. He was a very uh, important and prominent French poet, novelist, journalist, uh, art and literary critic as well. Uh, he's often associated with Romanticism, but also with Parnassianism symbolism, uh, decadence or decadentism, and even modernism. We'll see why exactly later. It's hard to uh, just put him in, put him just in one category. Um, um, his literary debuts are often associated with Hugo. He will soon become a very close friend with Hugo as well as with Nerval. Uh, he was um, in the audience where they were sh showing the, when there was a premiere of uh, La Bataille d'Ernani, Hugo's play. And what is interesting about him is that that night, uh, people who were on the side uh, of the um, 
people who are part, who were partisans of romanticism were verbally and non-verbally um, fighting with those who were uh, partisans, defendants of classicism. And there is a really famous picture, you can Google it, where uh, Gautier is, of course, at the side of the um, uh, romantic movement in his uh, Red West, showing his chest like this and, you know, fighting for the romantic movement and romanticism. Um, um, before I tell you what his notable works are, um, there's two things that I always, if you don't know about, about Gautier, I think there's two things, two points that you should really uh, memorize him or remember him for. First, if you ever heard, first, if you ever heard of um, the slogan, uh, the motto, l'art pour l'art, which is art for art's sake in English, well, that's what he said. You know, 19th century was uh, his era of uh, industrialism, industrial revolution. Uh, you know, Paris was back then just this, was flourishing in capitalism and Osmanization. So there was this need, especially from Gautier, to defend art uh, because art was becoming a business, right? What is the purpose of art? in uh, the era of industrialism. Why are we painting? What is artist? What is his purpose? What is his role? Are we painting just to make money, to sell this piece of art, this creation, this production? Or its purpose is just what it is, its essence. So, l'art pour l'art. Second thing, uh, I, I personally, uh, always recall him for is that Baudelaire dedicated his uh, masterpiece Fleur du Mal, Flowers of Evil, that were published in 1857 to Gautier himself. And I will read to you, in English of course, um, um, Baudelaire's dedication, right, which he begins uh, the Flowers of Evil with. So I'm, I'm, I'm reading to you. To the impeccable poet, to the perfect magician of French letters, to my very dear and very revered master and friend, Théophile Gautier, with sentiments of the most profound humility, I dedicate these unhealthy flowers. Needles to say, uh, Gautier was really, really uh, appreciated, read, studied, um, you know, by Hugo, by Mallarmé, Baudelaire. He really left a big uh, trace on the romantic and symbolist moment in France. His notable works are, as I said, he wrote a lot. He wrote poems, novels, tales. He was an art and literary critic. He worked uh, as a journalist and uh, editor in um, La Presse, France Littéraire, Monde Universel. His most not uh, notable works are, I guess, uh, Emo et Camé which he published in uh, 1852. Uh, La Comédie de la Mort, 1838. Les Gens de France, 1833. Then there's also a lot of plays that he wrote, Un Voyage en Espagne, La Juive de Constantine, Regardez-me ne touchez pas, etc. Of course, his most famous novels, is, I think, Mademoiselle de Maupin, which he published in uh, 1835. We have also Le Roman de la Momie, The Romance of a Mummy in uh, 1858. One of his most famous short stories are, I think, La Morte Amoureuse, where, um, which was published in 80, 1836. And it's really important, I think, for the French fantastic because 
we have um, the elements of um, vampirism. We have this priest that that, that receives uh, nocturnal visits from a female vampire. Uh, one of Cleopatra's Nights, another fantastic romance, is published in 1882, etc. Okay, I think we can now start. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, just please um, uh, drop them in the discussion board. I, I will, I will read them. I will. I will reply to them uh, at my nearest convenience. Okay, let's start with uh, with the um, fantastic tale. So Gautier and Todorov first. I read both Todorov and uh, Gautier's story in in French, <laughs> so um, I will try to give you the best possible references and translation that I could. I mean, I saw Professor Kuradi also uploaded it in English, so I will use that too. Um, okay. So this is the edition that I have. Conte et Récit Fantastique, uh, Fantastic Tales, Fantastic Stories. And it has a lot of, um, it's a compilation, it's an anthology of Gautier's fantastic story. So if you liked uh, Le Pied de Momie, uh, get get this edition, get the compilation. I'm pretty sure you will like other other stories too. Okay, uh, just to summarize quickly, because um, I might be sharing this, this video with, with um, other academics. So for those who don't know the story, I am just going to give a, just going to summarize it quickly. So, the story starts with a um, young man entering the curiosity shop somewhere in France. Later on, we will find out that he's 27 years old. Uh, it might be Gautier himself. Let's not get into this discussion, narrator, uh, uh, principal character, I mean, protagonist, narrator, etc. But you know, this person is 27 years old and he obviously writes. Why? How do we know that he writes? Because, because he's looking for a paper clip. Well, he's looking for a paper holder or paper organ organizer, sometime that, something that could keep all his literary drafts and articles um, organized. Of course, the very first description he gives of the antique shop is that it um, it looks like it's it looks like a chambre moyen âge. Uh -huh. We immediately have this uh, description that is telling us that this antique shop is has that medieval trait, like always. Fantastic tales are very like I said before, um, passeist or passeistic, there's always that uh, return to um, the um, medieval times. I think that this exaggeration and hyperbolization that Todorov was talking about, that is one of the most important traits of fantastic, we already find in the description of the, of the curiosity shop, is not that exaggerated, I think that the exaggeration will be even more excessive once he once he encounters the thousands and thousands of years old uh, pharaohs. But we already have the the description at the beginning of the curiosity shop that is uh, that is very um, detailed and exaggerated in a way. Um, um, at one point, he sees this food that looks like a mummy's food, and he becomes fascinated, if not possessed slash obsessed by with it, that he decides to buy it, even though it wasn't his. I didn't really understand at the beginning how can a 
pied de momie organized and keep keep uh, papers organized but i guess at that moment he forgot about why he came there at first what he wanted to buy at first um, so he sees this pied de momie and he decides to buy it because well it's so beautiful it's ancient it's magical and he has to have it after that we have something that could be sort of a announcement to what's going to happen later which is the moment where the seller the merchant the the shop assistant in the in the curiosity shop uh, prevents him or um, uh, informs him um, warn that's the word that I'm he warns him that um, he first tells him that this pied de momie uh, belongs to the princess Hermontis Hermontis which is a real name, by the way, but it, it wasn't a princess. It was a place in Egypt, I believe. I, I, will, I, will, I will give you a precise um, information later. But this is the foot of, uh, of the of Hermonitis princess. And the seller tells him, uh, be careful, because if you buy it, her dad might be really, really mad. We have something that, you know, a lot of writers do. We have this announcement, uh, this warning, uh, this alarm, something is going to happen. And this paragraph here is really important because, again, it's announcing the prophecy, the curse, the horror, the arrival of the dad, whatever, but it's announcing something macabre, right? Uh, the narrator uh, is telling us that um, he he has the the food. He buys the food and he comes back home. What happens next? Well, it happens that the. This, this princess, Hermonitis, comes to him. He receives a nocturnal visit, visitation from this princess. This princess, she's described as very beautiful. She's, uh, we have this exotic orientalist description of her. She's wrapped in white um, bandages. She's covered with red hieroglyphs and she's missing one foot. So that's why she came, right? Now the exaggeration here is not so, this description of her for me is, uh, I feel like Gautier, and that's probably because of L'art pour l'art, there's not that much intrigue here. There's not that much uh, for what 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 matters for Gautier most is uh, aestheticism, is art per se. So he's paying a lot of attention to these details, to describing this princess, this foot, this statue, because it's beautiful and beauty deserves to be. Uh, described um, who is this princess exactly why she came here we will find out the moment when he and Gautier here is not how can I say he's not scared he's not terrified um, in Tarketis, uh, A Dead Man's Bone, the, the protagonist is scared. He is, he has explanation to why are these things are happening 
to him because he himself is into occultism, uh, magnetism, and um, hypnosis. We have a part when he actually goes to see hypnotic sessions and mesmerisms. But he consciously he's um, summoning these spirits, but he's scared. Unlike Gautier, Gautier is not well consciously or intentionally summoning anyone, but he's not scared either. Um, he's very fascinated and with this princess that he, you know, willingly uh, accepts to travel to this pharaoh's world with her. Uh, this scene is really important to me because when he gets to the, he says they travel through corridors, he sees the sky, uh, the firmament, but I had a feeling like there are two witches fly, flying in the sky. And the moment where he gets to that corridor where all the, he says there's like, like 700 pharaohs, they all look dead, they're wrapped in white, um, there's hier hieroglyphs all over. Now, I have to really throw in a historical context here. It's not surprising, well, at least I wasn't surprised that Cotier uh, had this uh, exaggerated descriptions of the pharaohs, or that he was using Egypt um, in his novel because this is uh, 19th century, right? Many, many artists, many artists, poets, writers, painters were fascinated back then by the Orient. For them, that was this mystical, exotic land their women were described in so many poems, like Butler dedicated so many poems uh, with these Egyptian princesses. Um, uh, so they were all fascinated and inspired. And I also have to, to, to um, point out that this is the century of, uh, of Egypt. And Egyptology, uh, in 19th century, this is when Jean-François Champignon uh, deciphered hieroglyphs, okay? Jean-François Jean Champignon was a French uh, uh, orientalist, philologist, Egyptologist, and he's the one who dis deciphered, uh, uh, deciphered hieroglyphs in 19th century. So the influence is huge, it's huge. Now, was this this moment there's this moment that um alain buzin uh talks about uh briefly in this in this preface at one point gautier i mean at one point the the protagonist asks the pharaoh uh can i marry your daughter he he he's uh, he's seeking permission but the pharaoh ironically uh, sarcastically, if you wish, says that, ask him, how old are you? He says, I'm 27. 27? Do you know how old we are? We cannot marry our prince to someone that is 27 years old and then that might die anytime soon, someone who is mortal, a mortal being. Well, we could get here in a whole discussion about whether this is uh, political or engaged literature. But we could definitely see the um, historical context here, namely colonialism. And, uh, you know, uh, he might be implicitly mentioning French exploitation of the Orient and uh, French colonialism. But that I will leave to, to, uh, <laughs> to, I guess, more uh, to other specialists. That's what I read in the preface and that's what I read from a lot of article actually, who were interested in that, who were um, 
talking about that moment in the book. Uh, what happens to the end? Uh, at the end, it happens that he wakes up and that he realized that everything was a dream. The princess visit, he's flying his, um, his own visit to the pharaoh's world. His presence among the dead, that was all a dream. As was it in Tarketi's uh, book too. Uh, what happens in the end, uh, in Gautier's story, the protagonist wakes up, he says, oh, this was just a dream. But then he approaches his desk and he realized that the food, the mummy's food was gone. And the protagonist in A Dead Man's Bone, the same thing happens to me. He walks up from his from his visions, from his illusions, from his dreams. When he approaches to the desk, he realized that that um, that bone uh, was missing. But both visitors left something on their own, right? Uh, um, the princess uh, leaves this green. Um, gem which represents the, the goddess Iris and that's the, the object that the protagonist sees when he wakes up instead of the uh, all you uh, of um, the foot and in the Tarketi story as well this protagonist instead of seeing the bone what he sees is actually the ribbon with the name of the ghosts that appear, um, Pietro Mariani, uh, and the black ribbon that he left there. I mean, <laughs> I don't know what you think, people, but similarities are, are obvious. So we could talk about that later. Um, right, I like in both. Um, okay, is this merveilleux? or étrange. Um, well, Todorova is saying how merveilleux is usually, are usually fairy tales and he, of course, uh, gives Perrault, Jacques Perrault's fairy tales as an example and he says that in merveilleux descriptions are usually exaggerated like in Simbad or uh, other stories where we have fantastic creatures and beasts, exaggerated descriptions of crocodiles, of paysage, which we don't really have in, uh, uh, in uh, Gautier's, except for these exaggerated descriptions of the pharaohs, but I don't think that makes it merveilleux. It, couldn't, it makes it exotic. It makes it also uncanny to, 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 to use uh, uh, in terms of Freud and Canny, or étrange in French, it could also be étrange because because well, how does the reader feels now? The reader feels confused, like he doesn't know what to believe in. If this was just a dream, then how come the food is not there? and the object, the green object, is. So it's not, it, we have this melange of, 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 of dreams and reality. I think that the protagonist is rather, I don't think he's dreaming or maybe he's between two but this, what he definitely had with the princess was his spiritual communication. It might be, he might be half asleep, half a, half uh, awakened. He might be uh, under the, you know, under alcohol or different um, hallucin again, um, hallucinatory. Um, spirits 
uh, which was actually quite which was omnipresent uh, in the 19 romantic and symbolist movement if we read Rimbaud or Baudelaire he's there so it's the moment where strange things are happening and uh, as, as Edgar Allan Poe would say it's like just because we cannot reason about it, we cannot explain it, doesn't mean that they're not there, that they're not real, right? So if you ask me, I think that, I think that's what is going on here, that that it's not really a dream, but that is something unconscious, that is a vision, that is a spiritual communication with the princess. Again, it might be under the influence of spirits, of drugs, which is quite, like I said, which is omnipresent in the 19th century. And of course, we have the historical context uh, where, uh, where uh, the importance of the Orient and uh, Egyptology, Egypt is uh, well presented. I uh, wrote down three, I wrote down three um, quotes that I find really interesting, in, pertinent, and somehow related to, to what I was saying before. And that is, first one is, uh, everything possible to be believed is an image of truth, uh, William Blake. Second one is, and which many of you would probably uh, appreciate, that is not that which can turn a lie, and with stranger eons, even that may die which makes me think some of the pharaohs who are eternally alive, but are not dead. And, um, and the last sentence, I, I really apologize for this Upper East Side noise. And the last sentence of, uh, in the Doyle's um, uh, story, Lot 249, that we were also assigned to read. But the wisdom of man is small, and the ways of nature are strange. And who shall put a bound to the dark things which may be found by those who seek for them? Again, um, and this is what I'm gonna conclude with. Um, Todorov, uh, according to Todorov, the narrator never lies. Protagonist might lie, but narrator never lies. And that is his role, not to lie. Um, um, then, yes, uh, the narrator in uh, Le Pied de Momie, uh, if according to Todorov, he never lies, then um, then I think that what I just explained before, like spiritual communication and uh, the these visions that m could be explained, even though they are not characterized as real, uh, is definitely in connection to, to what Todorov was saying about the role of the narrator. Um, um, I probably wanted to say something else, but I cannot think of anything right now. So if you guys have any questions, any comments, please, uh, please write. I, I want to, I am looking forward to reading you all. And I hope that um, my brief presentation helped you and we will discuss it more, you know, this week uh, on Thursday, okay? Bye!